welcome back to Myrtle's Rant. Today I'm actually going to play for you a pre-recorded conversation. Paul Michael Keichel and myself were invited by Sandput, which is the South African network of people who use drugs, who are also a, an affiliate organization of Fields of Green, to give a few presentations to their field workers who are learning all about drugs and the law at the moment. And it's been a particularly interesting series of, of webinars. Charles has sat in on some of them, Paul Michael and myself. Uh, there's breakaway sessions within the Zoom. It's really amazing how, how everybody can get together, 30 people in a room and have a uh, online and have a really, really constructive time. The field workers are incredibly engaged because they are the network of people who use drugs, so they are completely connected to the issue. So uh, this week, we, both Paul Michael and myself, were, were rather busy. So Sandpud had another presentation coming up. So what we decided to do, because PM was uh, in Johannesburg at the time and was visiting us here at the jazz farm, we decided to sit down and film a conversation, a casual conversation between the two of us on a very serious subject. The brief that we were given by Sandpud was all about thresholds. Now in the cannabis community, we call this plant counting. And one of the things on my list for Myrtle's Rant was this plant counting issue because you know, it's very, very close to our hearts, very close to the hearts of the whole of the legacy cannabis industry. And I don't think that this issue has been addressed enough worldwide. You know, Germany has just said some ridiculous amount of plants, like two plants per, per person. And of course, nothing about the bottles of whiskey. So Paul Michael came to visit us here at the Jazz Farm and we filmed this conversation, which we are now uh, sending out to you. Uh, thank you very much to Sandput for giving us permission. And we're also giving a shout out to our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. at Sandput and the amazing, amazing work that they do. It really is. It's um, incredibly difficult the conditions that people work under and the issues that they have to deal with. So we really do salute the brave people of Sandpud. So I hope you enjoy this conversation between myself, Paul Michael Keichel, the head of Fields of Green for All's legal team. Hello to all of our Sandpud colleagues and welcome to the Hotbox studio. Um, I'm very pleased today by a stroke of luck to have Paul Michael Kachel here with me. My name is of course Myrtle Clark from Fields of Green for All. Uh, Paul Michael is from Cullinan Associates and the head of our legal team here at, at Fields of Green for All. So unfortunately we couldn't be with you in person on uh, the Zoom session but we decided that we'll record a little something, seeing as we are right here at the Hotbox Show here at the Jazz Farm. Um, and what we're going to do today with, in the broader topic of drug decriminalization, we're going to speak about this very, very wide, intricate topic um, called thresholds uh, and amounts. And now this is, of course, one of our 10 crisis points. Uh, in my last presentation, I went through those 10 crisis points, and you can, of course, find them at fieldsofgreenforall.org.za, and you can just search 10 crisis points on our blog page, and it outlines what those points are. Now, this whole issue in our world uh, is about plant counting, um, how much dacha you are allowed to have on you, how much you're allowed to grow, how much you're allowed to be storing, Obviously, for now, it's only storing in your private space. But then this also stretches out to how much do you consume? Do you consume it personally? And so on. So that's um, our topic for today. And thank you so much to uh, Angela and Klaus and uh, everybody at Sandput for, for bringing up this incredibly important issue. It is actually an international issue as we see cannabis regulations being perpetrated all around the world. Um, in Europe, of course, in the Americas, uh, this issue of thresholds and plant counting is certainly a very, very topical one. So without any further ado, as they always say on a YouTube video, <laughs> what, uh, when, let's kick this off with, what does plant counting mean for you, PM? Thanks, Mertz. Um, well, firstly, we're not, we're not coming to you uh, in a vacuum. We ourselves, are, I might be a lawyer and you might be an activist, but we, like you, are people who use drugs. 
um, some, some of them legal, some of them illegal, and plant counting and thresholds. Well, I, I suppose the first thing to say is that cannabis um, is this first toe in the water. You've been saying it for years that uh, cannabis is the gateway drug to reasonable and rational drug reform or reasonable and rational drug law. Um, and now all of a sudden we, <laughs> we're in this weird situation where in 2018, the Constitutional Court says to our Parliament that it's unconstitutional to prevent people from using and uh, cultivating cannabis in their in their private spaces um, and and for you know personally so so obviously not selling this cannabis um, but the Constitutional Court didn't impose this concept of limiting the the number of plants or the the weight of cannabis that anybody has in their possession and this is something that parliament has decided unilaterally is is something that they're going to do and it's something that as a lawyer i say is open to constitutional challenge because um we've always proceeded by way of analogy one of one of the primary things that we did when we started fighting the trial of the plants is to say we just want to be treated as poorly as tobacco and alcohol users and Mertz, we've been saying this for ages, but nobody comes and kicks down your door or arrives uh, purportedly in terms of some act of parliament and counts the number of uh, bottles of wine or the number of bottles of whiskey, or for that matter, the number of cartons of cigarettes that you have in your home. Um, and, and we're going to say that that's arbitrary and irrational because ultimately, just because these are legal drugs that uh, have been endorsed by Western society for a number of decades or a number of centuries, doesn't change the fact that they are drugs and that these are per se harmful drugs that Parliament apparently doesn't think that it needs to set a threshold on. So why is it that all of a sudden the lawmakers and the enforcers of yeah. the law think that it's okay to come onto your personal private property and start telling you that if you've got more than a certain number of plants, you are, you are now a criminal in terms of some act of Parliament. It's, in my view, it's not only madness hypocritical but it's fundamentally unconstitutional i think and i've said this so many times that i think it's got to do with laziness and it's got to do with ignorance so the laziness certainly um refers to doing your research properly and not just cutting and pasting the law from somewhere else so we've seen in the in the news lately that germany have are now going to restrict the germans to two plants so I'm not sure exactly what you would do with two plants. Myself as a heavy cannabis user, what I would do with two plants. Also, I think Canada has a has a, a, a restriction of four plants. Switzerland, which was one of the first private uh, home grow um, countries, is I think six or eight plants. And the latest iteration of the Cannabis for Private Purposes Bill, I think was 15 plants. But uh, 8 to 15 years in jail if you had more plants than that. And my question is always, and this was my question very, very bluntly and very, very openly in the last, do you remember? Yeah. In the last uh, time we presented to, to Parliament for the Private Purposes Bill, and I said to them, who is going to come and count my plants? Who is going to do that? Can you imagine over 70 murders a day now in South Africa, and they're going to send the police around counting people's dacha plants. Are they going to go to the very, very remote communities in, say, Pondoland, where you have to park your car and you have to walk through a river and then three hours through the mountains to go and find the fields? And then are you going to go and go one, two, three, four? Or are you going to say, no, it's too much and you're going to spray them all with glyphosate, you know? Or are you going to go to the Northern Cape? Are you going to go row across the Orange River in your little boat to go to the islands to go and bust the rusters for growing too many plants? So it's just not rational. It really isn't. And that's where, why I say that the, the, that, that parliament, parliamentary committee are lazy because of the cut and paste. And I say that they are ignorant because we have the scale of harms from Professor David Nutt. That is something that I would really urge the participants to, to look up. You can just search scale of harms on our website and you'll find lots of information about that. You'll find the diagram. Of course, in, in our, um, in our, which way can I go here on the camera? In our manifesto, there's the scale of harms diagram from Professor David Nutt et al, uh, who came, uh, this is old research now with 
what's the most dangerous drug? Alcohol is at the top, all the way down to psilocybin mushrooms at the bottom. And we need regulations according to harm. But of course, as you know, the harms have never been ventilated in court, so... No, they, they, no. they, 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 they haven't been. I mean, I, I suppose to a limited degree they work because the constitutional court, our constitutional court in 2018, seemed to recognize, I mean, it doesn't seem to have filtered down in the judgment, but we were certainly there when, when this was being argued. And, and yeah. you'll recall that Justice Cameron threw up his hands at one stage, uh, I, I think to Reg Willis, uh, advocate Reg Willis, and said, but come on, we all know that this isn't as harmful as tobacco and alcohol. Yeah. You know, do we even need to debate this issue? Which, yeah. which then, you know, going back to the scale of harms, it seems to be almost trite at this point. You know, do, yeah. we, do we really need to prove that this is less harmful than tobacco and alcohol. And the fact is that we actually don't because the onus of proof, as it turns out in terms of our constitution, not the German constitution, not the Canadian constitution, which is why I say that we cannot use them as examples yeah. because we are a unique liberal democracy with its own constitution mm -hmm. and its own laws. What it says is that if an act of parliament, a law of general application is going to purport to limit the rights that are promised to us in terms of the Bill of Rights, which the Constitutional Court has already said to us, includes the right to personally use and cultivate cannabis um, in a private space, then it needs to do so mindful of things, and this is section 36 of our Constitution, such as a rational connection between the limitation and what it's trying to achieve. Exactly. Now, the how, harm. <laughs> but that's the point. So how is it that all of a sudden, arbitrarily, you were once on eight adult plants, but now because people have kicked and screamed, you're on 15. <laughs> so uh, is, is, is Parliament really going to, with a straight face, yeah. or our lawmakers, going to go a second round in the constitutional court and say, well, actually, we had some sort of science that showed that... Um, Eight plants actually wasn't that harmful for an individual, but we have a rational basis for, yeah. for, for now limiting you to, to, to 15 plants. Uh, all of a sudden, we've scientifically and rationally determined that this is harmful for an individual. Um, so, so I think it's very, very clear that they're not going to be able to prove that. And therefore, all of this, co this, this concept of plant counting is per se unconstitutional. Um, and for that matter, and it's a point, you know, sometimes I feel like a broken record, but the Constitutional Court didn't say that it, it, it didn't refer only or exclusively to personal consumption. It said personal use. Now, if I'm growing cannabis for cattle fodder, uh, and this is my private herd of cattle, and I'm not going on to, to, to sell those cattle, I mean, per se, that's, that's personal private use. Similarly, if I want to surround my, my 20 hectare farm with, with a hedge of cannabis, why am I not allowed to do that? The Constitutional Court said that I have that I have the right to do that. So, you know, it, it just begs this question, you know, who is making these decisions? Which, which prohibitionist in Parliament is influencing all of these people that the answer keeps being no? We, we, we're only going to let you go so far because yeah. we've arbitrarily decided that beyond that point, you're doing too much harm to yourself and you're doing too much harm to society. When they're unable to prove it. We know that they're unable to prove it. They're totally unable to prove it. And we get these big contradictions in this parliamentary hearings, you know. Um, I hope that nobody who's watching this today uh, has to sit through those incredibly painful, it takes us days, we have PTSD. And just the fact that we can almost laugh about what it is like speaking to parliament. I think that webinars like this are incredibly important, don't you? I mean, they really, so that, so that the steps for, for ultimately our ultimate goal of, of harm reduction and, and complete decriminalization um, doesn't have to go through these painful steps in getting there. What the future holds, we certainly don't know. But I know from, I've just come back from Nigeria um, and, and the conference, it was the 14th biennial um, uh, conference on research and information about substance abuse big long thing and a whole lot of it was about harm reduction and and I think that that is maybe what parliament are trying to do they're trying to reduce the harms but they don't know what the harms are and they, you know? and they forget the harms of dragging you through the criminal justice system yes, they, yes. They, they forget that you're supposed to put that on no, the they, scales yeah no they do because what's that oh that's just the cannabis people you know who actually have to pay for it 
set aside the time, give up our jobs, all of that thing, thing raise the money for the legal team because the legal team also have to uh, pay the rent and feed the family. Turns you out, know, yeah. I mean, one can't, um, one can't expect ad nauseum. We've been doing this for twelve years for our legal team to now like work pro bono again. You know, it's just that's how it is. But the one incident that really, really hit me in Nigeria was we were speaking about this exact thing and what is harm reduction? You, you first have to establish the harms and then you try and reduce those harms. So say you have needle and syringe exchange programs or you have opioid substitute uh, um, uh, therapy. And the one woman stood up and she was obviously very religious which was which is, is a problem from the beginning so she was coming from this moral point of view she says well this sounds to me as a service provider of people who are having problems with substance abuse um is that you are rewarding their bad behavior so i think that what cannabis can show for the much more complicated issue or the broader drug issue and there will be no drug apartheid Cannabis can show these incremental steps that need to be taken for for the world to actually understand what harm reduction is. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously a lot of people don't get it. And if this does reduce harm, why why is it not being done with tobacco and alcohol? Exactly. You know, it begs a big question. Yeah. I mean, yes, I mean it is a prerogative to ban these things or to limit yeah. these things, but yeah, I think the argument has always been if you're not going to limit those things, then you can't legitimately pur purport to limit yeah. others. Yeah. And you know that I'm involved now in fighting for the legalization of psilocybin. And yeah. ultimately, my my end goal is to is to pretty much decriminalize or legalize all of the low harm entheogens. Yeah. Are we going to face this time and time again? You know, are we going yeah. to get this right with cannabis and have you know, use the lessons and, and, and not make the same mistakes again with, with yeah. cannabis or as the dominoes fall and each of these entheogens are legalized, which I think is inevitable. Unfortunately, we, yeah. we, we seem to piggyback off foreign jurisdictions, but each time, are we going to have this fight? Are they going to now say, okay, you know, you can have, you can have uh, 12 psilocybin, dried psilocybin mushrooms <laughs> in your <laughs> presence, but as soon as you've got 13, now you're going to go to prison for, for a yeah. number of years. You know, when, when does this madness stop and when does our thinking actually shift meaningfully so that yes. so that we're actually looking at the fact that there is no war on drugs there's this war on drug users and actually yeah. by implementing and enforcing this war on drugs we're actually ruining lives we're harming nobody yeah. um, as you correctly said needle exchange programs social upliftment helping those in need creating an environment where people don't fall on drugs as their only comfort in the world yeah. These are things that truly help people. When it was that somebody decided that we are actually helping individuals by putting them into prison and pulling them out of schools and losing them their jobs, I don't know. But but to me, it's it's certainly it can be classed as madness. Yes, because as that woman said, and I've never heard it say it's said so plainly, you're rewarding their drug use. You know. So I think that that. <clears throat> There was, I remember you telling us really, really early in our campaign, there will be a certain percentage, maybe 10% of people, that you will never change their minds. But you've got those other 90% that of those, there might be 50% of them that still need some convincing. We, we definitely will, will definitely get there. But you know, as Ethan Nadelman, who uh, some of you may know, he was at uh, Drug Policy Week in 2017 as one of the keynote speakers. He's just been with me in, in Nigeria and they did a whole panel on tobacco law reform. And he said that the way that countries are cutting down on vaping, on vape pens, when it's a nicotine delivery method that is less harmful than the combustion of the plant, you know? And he said, L please, please, please let uh, the whole tobacco issue not become prohibition 2.0 yeah. because and we're seeing it here in South Africa as well they've kicked back against vape pens and oh the children and then what about the children and what about the children now I actually um, voice recorded his speech about what about the children and he said they will always revert to that when it comes to harm reduction measures and you should be much happier that the kids are vaping at 15 and not smoking cigarettes at 15. And then he said that they have the, the scientific evidence to show that if you are 30 years or under now, today, in this world, doesn't matter where you are in the world, 
you are 90% less likely to die from smoke tobacco related illness than everybody who's over 30 because in the short amount of time with vaping we've managed to introduce these harm reduction measures whether they've been accepted by the government or not i found that very interesting to say we have actually i mean how long has vaping been going maybe six eight years or so six years uh, or so years since now. you could buy a little twist whatever yeah. so uh, I, I don't know temporal distortion i've been stoned the whole time <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly um cannabis is totally illegal in in nigeria so i could only take my thc vape pen and uh it was certainly really helpful and i've come back with a much better tolerance level um so that little tolerance a break you see so I can take my tolerance break. I did not, it hardly even crossed my mind when I was in Nigeria mm. that I really, oh, I could really do with the spliff. Or oh, I'm not going to sleep if I don't have my cannabis. You You're know, probably too busy. I'm, yeah, too busy, distracted, fine. I wasn't thinking. But on the nine hour flight back, geez, did I ever want a cigarette? Yeah, <laughs> and no, and they confiscated my twist little vape pen at the, at the airport. So I didn't even have my anti-stress harm reduction because thing. of the because of the okay. battery probably hmm? because of the battery because of the battery and yeah. i should have just put it in my chicken luggage and i didn't think so anyway yeah but i think that we've just about covered uh, everything that that we need to do today and charles is of course on hand to to answer any of your questions and remember that this is the cannabis in south africa the people's plant is uh, available for it's a six meg download for free from our from our website and um, look at that scale of harms because I think that it's very important when it comes to um, to this issue of thresholds. And then also do yourself a favor and go back and read the the cannabis um, uh, judgment from September 2018. Very important that language, like you said, use. It didn't say whether you are going to feed your cows. It didn't say whether you are going to make cannabis oil for a sick relative it didn't say any of that so when it comes to legal things and particularly with things like decriminalization what is decriminalization actually because cannabis is not decriminalized in South Africa I think we must realize that so just now when I was away on our little arrests whatsapp group you know there's two three arrests while I was away big ones of people who are now being dragged through the courts at our public expense yeah. So um, it's an incremental process. Decriminalization is not always what it seems. And um, it's been really nice chatting today. Yeah. And, yeah. I, think, and I think just to close off, uh, it has been nice chatting, but I think the, a very important point that just, you know, floats to the surface from what you've said is if you leave things like plant counting in, it just leaves room for this police abuse to, yeah. get, to get the arrest quotas up, to continue yeah. harvesting the low-hanging fruit, not actually solving real crime, not yeah. actually preventing harm, but actually just ruining the lives of everyday, otherwise law-abiding citizens. Exactly. Through your ignorance and your laziness. And lack of empathy. That, that, yeah. that, that to me is Humanity. the Humanity. Heart. That's the problem. Yeah. Is that's, that's, that's the most tragic thing in this, is where is the heart? Where is the love for your fellow human being in, yeah. in, in this lawmaking? And it doesn't seem to me that it's there. And I mean, we can most certainly say from the bottom of our hearts that every single one of you people that has joined here today have got the biggest hearts ever, you know, to be working in the field that you do, that you are, um, and, and co making such a meaningful contribution to our society as largely young people in this group, you know, we're really proud of you. When I was in Nigeria, um, my colleague Maria Goretti Ane from, from Ghana said, well, tomorrow morning I've got to be presenting with Sanput. So... The fact that we all over Africa, we're getting together, we're speaking about harm reduction, we're speaking about the different aspects of decriminalization. I think that we, we are arguing on the right side of history here. And I think that um, I'll just salute Sanford once again for having this, this awesome series. And uh, Charles is on the Zoom session and he will certainly be on hand to answer any of your questions. And remember that he is actually our victim support um, member of our crew of our Stop the Cops and Join the Q campaign. So he'll tell you more, of, uh, more about that and answer any questions that you have. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks for inviting us. Bye. Ciao for now.